Well, thank you, Ewan. Um, we're going to turn in our Bibles to that passage that we read earlier in Leviticus chapter 25. And you might have wondered, as Ewan was reading it, what possible relevance it could have to us. Um, there's so much in the Old Testament that immediately strikes us like that, but we just have to dig a little bit below the surface. I'm going to begin by, in a way that I've never ever begun a sermon before, I'm going to quote the words of John Lennon. And um, in a, his Christmas ditty, which I think we've heard several times over the last few days, which begins, so this is Christmas, and what have we done? Another year over, and a new one just begun. I'm not sure it's incredibly profound, but it's a good question to ask right at this stage in the year. So this is Christmas, and what have we done? Uh, generally speaking, we don't think about Christmas and what we have done or what we should be doing, but nonetheless, it's a good exercise for a Christian. It's also a good time to reflect upon a year. When I was in pastoral ministry, I always used to preach uh, on the end of the year and the beginning of the year, just separate sermons. This was a habit I got into, and uh, I think people found it helpful one way or another. And uh, one passage which is particularly adapted, I think, to uh, looking at the new year and the prospects and uh, how we should be living, what we should be doing, um, is this chapter when we speak about the year of Jubilee. It's uh, intimately connected with the idea of, of time. And uh, when we change from one year to another, a new year of grace, as we used to call it in the old days, um, we are meant, I believe, by the providence of God to be uh, reflecting upon the passage of time and uh, uh, consider it as a, a very sobering reminder of our mortality, another year that's uh, been turned over, the calendar's turned over, and here is a year with all its fresh possibilities uh, lying before us. And uh, our attitude towards it will be determined by the year we've experienced and by all our experience and all our hopes and all our fears. But uh, let's just think a little bit about time before we get into our, our passage. Um, we divide up time by means of astronomy. It's often been said we can't accelerate time and we can't uh, uh, slow time down. Uh, uh, the only thing we can do is measure it. And that's what we do. And as I say, we measure it by means of astronomy. Uh, you know that uh, a day is the length of time it takes for the earth to rotate on its axis. A month is the length of time it takes for the moon to orbit the earth. A year is the length of time it takes for the Earth to orbit the sun. Um, but then there's this rather awkward period called uh, the week, the seven day week. Um, does this have any astronomical justification? Why do we have a seven day week? Of course, people have tried to change it. Uh, Napoleon tried to change most things and Napoleon tried to do away with the seven day week. Um, he, he tried to establish, he was very keen on decimalization, was Napoleon, and uh, he tried to establish a 10-day week, um, and uh, it, uh, it just didn't work, and nobody could make it work, it just collapsed very, very quickly, and he, he gave up, and then about 100 years later, uh, when the uh, revolutionaries took over in Russia, Lenin tried to do the same thing, he tried to establish a 10-day week, he thought it was uh, breaking with um, capitalism, I suppose, I don't know, but he, he wanted to make everything different. He, he tried to establish a 10 day week. And uh, again, it, it, didn't, it didn't work. It just wasn't possible. There seemed to be some natural rhythm which determined that a seven day week was right. And of course, as Christians, we say, yes, well, of course, well, the seven day week is ordained by God. And if we go back to that question I asked at the start, does the seven day week have an astronomical justification like the other periods of time? Well, my answer is of course very much so because it is the most fundamental astronomical justification of all because the seven day week is the time that it took for God to create the whole universe in the first place. So every other measure of time is uh, rather subsidiary to the seven day week when it's looked on in that way. Now, just think about the week, because you have to think about the week when you read Leviticus chapter 25. We know, of course, that God 
rested after the creation on the seventh day. And that's why every seventh day thereafter was called the Sabbath, a day of rest for all his creatures. It was to be a day of rest and worship. It was to be a, a, a picture of heaven. It was to be a, a celebration of the creation. And then, of course, that wasn't all. It gets a little bit more complicated, as it always seems to do when you read through Leviticus. Um, every week of years, that is, every seventh year, was to be called a Sabbath year when, as we read, the land would lie fallow for the full 12 months. It was uh, an opportunity to um, exercise faith in God's goodness, that he wouldn't let them starve in that period, that he was in command and control, and he was utterly uh, sovereign over nature and creation, and they didn't have to worry. And so uh, their faith was strengthened during that Sabbath year. And of course, as we now know through I don't know, our ecological and environmental studies. It was good for the earth itself to lie fallow. God knew what he'd created and how best it should be managed. But then there's something more. Uh, to cap it all, every week of weeks of years, in other words, every seven times seven, that is 49 years, was to be followed by the 50th year, of course, and that year was called the year of Jubilee. That's why, of course, we have uh, the, the name Jubilee and the, we think of a Jubilee. Um, we have, um, I don't know, we have silver Jubilees and diamond Jubilees and uh, possibly in a year or so, platinum Jubilee for our queen, I think. But um, uh, primarily the word Jubilee refers to what we would call a golden Jubilee. It refers to what happens every 50 years. And every 50 years, as God commanded through Moses, should be obeyed by the Israelites in Old Testament Israel. Every 50 years, there was to be this year of Jubilee. And um, it began um, unusually, but also very significantly, it began on the Day of Atonement. And um, you know, many of you, I'm sure, what happened on the Day of Atonement. Uh, the high priest uh, would be able to go into the Holy of Holies uh, for that solitary time in the year. He would uh, go in. He sacrificed uh, one goat and uh, sprinkled its blood on the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. And then he took a second goat. And you remember he laid his hands on the second goat, symbolically transferring the sins of the people onto the animal and driving it away into the desert. The goat escaped. It was a, an escaped goat, a scapegoat. That's where our, our word scapegoat comes from. Um, with our sins transferred or the people of Israel's sins symbolically transferred onto the head of the goat, the goat escaped. It was a symbol of God taking away the sins of the people. So two goats representing uh, more than one goat could represent of the complexity of what was happening here. One goat is sacrificed, the blood is shed, the blood is sprinkled upon uh, the Ark of the Covenant of the Holy of Holies, just that once in the year, and the second goat is banished, carrying our sins uh, symbolically with it. That was the point of the Day of Atonement. And of course, uh, every aspect of the ceremonial law of the Old Testament points forward to Jesus Christ. And the Day of Atonement uh, particularly points forward to what Jesus Christ achieved on the cross. And if we had time, uh, we would be able to turn to Hebrews chapter 9, and you can read it for yourself afterwards, where we read that uh, Jesus is our great high priest, going not into a holy of holies made with hands, but going into heaven itself which the Holy of Holies was meant to represent. And he goes in not with the blood of goats, but he goes in with his own precious blood and makes atonement once and for all for his people. So you can see that the, the activities of the high priest on the day of atonement is supremely representative and prophesies the, the great work of the Lord Jesus Christ upon the cross of Calvary in bringing all those types and pictures to fulfillment and fruition 
uh, so that we can benefit in under the new covenant and the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. How wonderful uh, that is. And the year of Jubilee begins on that day. And the reason it begins on that day is because the year that follows is to be an emblem and a sim symbolic representation <coughs> of all the benefits that flow from the cross. Everything that flows from the, from the atonement, the day of atonement, is now shed upon the people. All the blessings are poured out upon them throughout this year. This year is to be a year of incredible blessing for the people. And it is to be a year when they will enjoy all that God has for them. All the achievements of God for his people are to be poured out uh, upon them. And uh, that's how it began. And every um, 50th year on the Day of Atonement, the sound of the ram's horns would ring out uh, throughout the land to mark the beginning of this special year, which, as I say, prefigures the blessings of the gospel that flow to believers from the cross. And all these blessings, everything we read about in Leviticus 25, which explain the year of Jubilee, they are all about redemption. And if you want a new beginning, a new start, which is what the year of Jubilee was all about, as we'll see, it is all about redemption. It's on the basis of redemption that we are offered a new start in our lives. Now, I really don't want to complicate it anymore. I want to be very simple from now on. And I just want to tell you the, the three fundamental blessings of the year of Jubilee and show you how they have great spiritual significance for us. And the first of these three blessings is the fact that the debts of the people that they had accrued perhaps over the previous 50 years, were all cancelled. And um, if the year of Jubilee teaches us anything, it teaches us the fact that uh, the economic system of Old Testament Israel was absolutely unique. Uh, no uh, land or country or nation has ever tried to copy it, as far as I can tell, but it worked perfectly for the Old Testament people of Israel as long as they were faithful. But the fact was that after those 50 years, for all the people, their debts were cancelled. Now just imagine that uh, your uh, uh, credit card company uh, writes to you and says that you owe them nothing. Uh, your, your, your finance broker uh, tells you that the car is yours. Your uh, bank or your um, mortgage society, building society, lets you know that your mortgage has been paid off. And uh, this is something you've been longing for. And there it all happens. It all happens at once. And uh, as you think about those things, you may be able to begin to see why the year of Jubilee was so keenly awaited and so joyfully welcomed, just like children love Christmas Day, probably for all the wrong reasons. Uh, so it was that the people of Israel in Old Testament times, they loved the year of Jubilee and the beginning of it on the Day of Atonement for all the right reasons, because of all the blessings that it was going to, to bring to them. So immediately we see the spiritual fulfillment of all these things. Our most serious debts by far are not material, but spiritual. Now you may be in serious debt, I don't know, materially, financially, I have no idea. I don't wish to know, it's none of my business. And you may be very worried about those things. But the fact of the matter is that you should be far more worried about your spiritual debts. Um, in the Lord's Prayer, of course, we ask the Lord to forgive us our, traditionally we say trespasses, but the word means debts, forgive us our debts. Sin is called debt here in the Lord's Prayer. Why? Because we owe God everything. We are, naturally speaking, incredibly and horribly and tragically and fatally in debt to God. We owe God, what do we owe God? People will say who aren't Christians, I don't owe him anything. 
He owes me. Well, I'm sorry. We owe God everything. We owe him our worship. We owe him our love. We owe him our service. We owe him everything because we owe him our very existence. Moreover, we've wasted or misused all the gifts that we've been given by him all of our lives. We've wasted and misused his greatest gift of all, life itself. That is our state before we are Christian, before we are redeemed, before we are made right. We have this horrendous debt to God, which it will be absolutely impossible for us to pay. And justly, he must bring us to book at the end of it all. But the glorious thing, of course, for the Christian is this. We know that on the cross, the Lord Jesus paid off our spiritual debts and wiped the slate clean. So that when we can daily or however often we recite the Lord's Prayer or we build our own prayer life upon the model of the Lord's Prayer, when we now ask God to forgive us, he can. And we can wash our feet day by day. We no longer need a bath, as it were, because we've been forgiven. Our debts have been taken away. That's what uh, the Bible says. The Apostle Paul uh, dwells upon this in his writing to the Colossians, his letter to the Colossians in chapter two. And um, it, it's translated like this in the NIV, I think it is, um, where Paul says, he forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which sounds like a mouthful, but that's what Paul is saying here. He forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And you can, you can feel the relief in Paul's words there. Every time you read Paul properly and you read his letters, you should feel his emotion because no one's more emotional as a writer than Paul. Everything he writes, his heart is so in it. And he, you can just feel the, 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 the strain and the tension draining away as he proclaims that glorious truth. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it, says Paul, to the cross. What a glorious thing it is to know our spiritual debt cancelled by our glorious God through what Jesus did upon the cross. The fruit of the atonement, the fruit of the day of atonement, the fact that our sins have been cleansed by the blood of Christ, have been sent away. As far as the east is from the west, driven away like that goat into the wilderness. The fact, the fruit of that is that our spiritual debt has been cancelled forever. That's the first and most obvious of the things that we're told in Leviticus 25. The second is similarly clear. Not only was their debt cancelled, but secondly, their slavery was ended going to read a few verses after the reading. I didn't, I didn't ask Ewan to read the whole of chapter 25. I think it was quite enough what he read out, wasn't it really? All in one go. But there we are. The, but if you read from verse 39, just going to read a few verses from verse 39. Their slavery was ended. If any of your fellow Israelites become poor and sell themselves to you, do not make them work as slaves. They are to be treated as hired workers or temporary residents among you. They are to work for you until the year of Jubilee. Then they and their children are to be released. And they will go back to their own clans and to the property of their ancestors. Because the Israelites are my servants, whom I brought out of Egypt. They must not be sold as slaves. Do not rule over them ruthlessly, but fear your God. Now, you've got to define what a slave is here to some extent, I suppose. But what was happening was this. Because of the debt that we've just been speaking about, many Israelites were forced to sell themselves as indentured servants, whatever you want to call it, but really as virtual slaves in order to keep themselves and their families alive. But Leviticus 25 and verse 10 declares, and we did read verse 10, didn't we? Consecrate the 50th year 
and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. And uh, that is what is being, we're being told here, uh, that um, liberty is being proclaimed. Um, I was fortunate a number of years ago uh, to go to um, Philadelphia and uh, visit um, what's now called the Independence Hall in Philadelphia. Philadelphia was uh, where uh, the American founding fathers um, signed the uh, uh, Constitution, the Declaration of Independence initially. And uh, what happened was a few days later, um, this um, declaration was read out throughout the, the 13 states that existed then uh, as they declared independence against um, Great Britain. And at that time, um, bells were rung uh, all over the states in, uh, to declare this fact that they had uh, become independent. And um, there is a very famous bell in um, Philadelphia. It's got its own building now, and it's called the Liberty Bell. And if we were Americans, we would all know about this bit of history, I should imagine. Um, and the Liberty Bell was uh, the bell that was rung in Philadelphia at that time. And on that bell, and I've seen it for myself, um, there's a verse inscribed, and that verse is, of course, Leviticus 25 and verse 10. And what it says uh, in the translation of the AV, but basically it's the same, proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. Those were the words, those are the words enshrined on the Liberty Bell outside the Hall of Independence in Philadelphia in the United States. And it must have been a wonderful thing, wasn't it, for them uh, to uh, proclaim liberty, say we are now free. We are no longer a colony having to pay taxes without representation. We are a free people, free to do our own things. And it must have brought great joy to many families. Um, I suppose when you mention this, you have to say it didn't bring instant freedom to all the African Americans who were enslaved and still slaves in the land at that time. Although the Liberty Bill Bell was taken around years later in the 19th century, and it was used uh, by the abolitionists who wanted to do away with slavery as uh, uh, an incitement to do the same and say, well, look, this is the verse on here, and yet it's not really true, is it? Because we still have slavery in our country. And it was used as a very powerful symbol of the fact that all the slaves should be set free. So anyway, that's just an illustration. But we need to look at this spiritually for ourselves. What's the application? What is this speaking about when we look at it as New Testament Christians? Again, of course, just as we may not be in material debt, so we are not any of us, I imagine, in physical slavery. But the New Testament has an awful lot to say about spiritual slavery. The Apostle Peter said that people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. We can be slaves in a, a minor way to all sorts of fads and fashions, can't we, even as Christians? Or, of course, we can be gripped by terrible vices that will ultimately destroy us. But the glorious truth of the gospel is this, that Jesus said, though everyone who sins is a slave to sin, if the Son shall make you free, you will be free indeed. It's wonderful verses, of course, in John's gospel, chapter eight. So we sometimes just talk about if the Son shall make you free, you will be free indeed. But he's saying this in the context of slavery. He's saying everyone who sins is a slave to sin. You could be freed from slavery to sin. You don't have to be mastered by these terrible habits or whatever it is, this cast of mind, this past which just enslaves you in ways of thinking and still cripples your actions. You don't have to be slaved in any of these ways. You are free. You can break free from everything that enslaves you. All spiritual bondage is done away with. This is what is foretold by the year of Jubilee. This is why the people rejoiced 
because they were no longer slaves, but they were free people. And the glorious thing about a Christian is that they are free, free in the most important way of all, free from the slavery of sin. And uh, how glorious to be able to say, Christ is my master, because to find Christ as your master is to know perfect freedom in our hearts and lives. Let's be entering a new year with this freedom once again reasserted. Let's ring the liberty bell and be sure that we're not enslaved by anything in the year that is to come. And then lastly, there's this third great privilege, this third great fruit of the atonement that we read about in um, Leviticus 25. Their um, debt was cancelled, their slavery was ended, and thirdly and lastly, their inheritance was restored. Their inheritance was restored. Verse 10 again, consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. Each of you is to return to your family property and to your own clan. What a glorious truth this is. How amazing the sort of socioeconomic system of Old Testament Israel is basically a foreshadowing of the blessings of the gospel. And that's, I suppose, what we should expect. Uh, in ancient Israel, as you probably know, the land of every tribe and clan and family was allotted originally by, by Moses and then by Joshua was uh, allotted in perpetuity. This is the land of this tribe. And then uh, in, in, in micro parcels of land, this, is, this belongs to this clan, this belongs to this family. They were uh, intended to be in perpetuity. Of course, all this is now lost. But the symbolism is not lost because the reality is here, as we shall see. And what happened, of course, in those days was that, that even if the poor had to sell off their land, it would ultimately be freely restored at the Jubilee. They could buy it back if they could afford to, or if they had a rich relative, they could buy it back at any time, according to how much it was worth, depending on what stage it was between the year of Jubilee and the next one. But in any case, look at verse uh, 28. If they do not acquire the means to repay, what was sold will remain in the possession of the buyer until the year of Jubilee. It will be returned in the Jubilee and they can then go back to their property. See, this is a glorious truth. Again, the slate is wiped clean. Even if they can't repay it, they're going to go back because it's the command of God that the land shall belong to their family in perpetuity. And as I say, this wonderfully foreshadows one of the great blessings of the gospel, one of the greatest blessings of the gospel. Just as in the beginning, Adam and Eve had to leave the Garden of Eden because of their sin. They left their inheritance before. They left behind the special land that God had uh, marked out for them on the earth. They had to leave it behind. It was their inheritance intended forever, but they had to leave it because of their sin. So our sin deprives us of our inheritance, of God's felt presence, of his fellowship, of his blessing, of all the things he intends us to have. But then, as a result of the gospel, as a result of receiving the gospel, of receiving Christ into our hearts and lives, as a result of trusting Christ, we enter into what Peter calls in his first letter, an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. Do you mean in perpetuity, Peter? Yes, just like the inheritance of the Old Testament Israelites. This is the fulfillment. This is what we have. This is the spiritual reality that all the material blessings of the past were pointing to. An inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. So that when you're a Christian, you know absolute spiritual rest and restoration here and now. And in the days to come, something even more wonderful, the days that will follow these days, the days when Christ comes again and establishes all new things, the days of the new creation. Um, 
It was said in the Psalm 37 and verse 11 that the meek shall inherit the land. It's the Psalm of David, Psalm 37. And of course, Jesus takes these words and quotes them in the Sermon on the Mount, but he greatly enlarges them so that in every translation you're going to read, it says not the meek shall inherit merely their portion of the land, but the meek shall inherit the earth. Because the fulfillment is always vastly greater than the promise. And what is being referred to here is not some mere physical portion of the earth's surface as we know it. But what is speaking about here is the great promise of the new heavens and the new earth, which is spelled out for us in glorious terms in the New Testament. And that Jesus is alluding to, even before it is spelled out by later New Testament writers, the meek shall inherit the earth. There is this glorious thing. Our bodies will be resurrected. We shall have glorious spiritual and physical bodies. And we shall in ways that is beyond our conception. That it's not even worth trying to imagine what it means. But we shall in a wonderful way inherit the earth. And this idea, the perpetual allocation of the land to the Old Testament Israelites was a prophecy of this. This is why it's important to study these books of Moses. This is why the ceremonial laws and all the laws of Israel are of such importance to us because they, in a sort of like an exploded diagram, um, they, they show all the different things and how they fit together. And this points forward to the glorious truths that we know as believers. All these provisions for Old Testament Israel have long since passed. But it doesn't matter. We have the record of them. We have the word of God concerning them. And what we are left with now is the eternal reality to which they pointed. And just as then, all the blessings of the year of Jubilee were never earned, but freely given. So it is today with all the blessings of the gospel. It teaches us that everything is all of grace. They didn't have to work for a thing. They only had to wait for the Jubilee, the blessings of the Day of Atonement, flooding into their hearts and souls during this special year. And that's all we have to do as Christians. All the blessings of the gospel, of the atonement, of the work of Christ upon the cross, as we trust in him and his saving work, all these blessings flow to us, all as a matter of grace. The year of Jubilee has passed and has been replaced by something far better, a day of grace. And just as the year of Jubilee brought the opportunity of a glorious fresh start for so many, so this day of grace does for us. That's always the wonderful promise of the day of grace. And at the start of a new year, just as the year of jubilee was begun on the day of atonement as we think about all that christ has done for us it is the promise of a fresh start our debts cancelled our slavery ended our inheritance restored can't we think about those things can't we dwell upon them they're ours in reality if we truly are the children of god and that's what we meditate upon when we see a chapter like this and we say how wonderful it is that God has done that for us. And in this year of grace, 2021, with which we're confronted, which we all hope will be far better than the one that has passed. Nonetheless, whatever it holds for us, and we don't know what it will hold. Thank God we don't know the future, even from day to day. Thank God we know that it will be all of grace and the blessing of God flowing from the cross will be bestowed upon each one of us and his church will prosper as a result of all his great work and its behalf. So what a blessing that is. Let me just close with a prayer um, that's by Christopher Idol. Christopher Idol is a um, famous uh, contemporary hymn writer. Um, it was a time when I knew him very well. In fact, uh, talking about jubilees, he, he wrote a, a hymn for Sheila and I, our silver jubilee, would you believe? And uh, we sang it and occasionally he asked us for permission to use it somebody else's jubilee, we don't mind. But there it is. And 
he wrote another hymn, not that hymn, but another hymn, and uh, it's a hymn relating to the Jubilee, and it, it goes like this, and it's a sort of prayer, and, well, it is a prayer, and I'm going to just end with these words. From our failure and our blindness, bound by debts we cannot pay, God of Jubilee, release us. Oh, renew us all, we pray. In a world exhausted, restless, still oppressing and oppressed, Lord of Sabbath, bring us freedom, resurrection, life, and rest. Now I wish you all a very happy new year. Amen.